Everyone knows. Okay, the video is starting. You got that bit, though. All righty. Well, oh, and we got Chris Welch on. Chris and Linda here in the camper. Yep. Oh, good to see you. Good to see you. What, is Linda trying to? Yep. Is Linda starting one, too? Yep. Okay, just make sure you guys are mute then so you don't get feedback from each other since you're right next to each other. <laughs> are the cats camping with you? No. <laughs> no. Why are you about to buy a house? All right, right. there's Linda. Okay, they good to, to see it. everybody. They have to use it. Okay, so in person here, we got Audrey, we got Dan. <laughs> Uh, we got Anna just coming in the door right now. Okay. Don't want to fill up my candy. <laughs> and then we got Pauline. Second round. Yeah, there you go. Give Pauline all the sugar. Oh. <laughs> then we got that. That's what they look like. Steve. I forgot what they look like. We got Joe, oh. Beth, and Joan. Okay, and online we got Gail oh. and Evan. And Chris and in person here, we just have a rowdy bunch because we in front of them. Okay. Oh, we found an eyeball. <laughs> All right. Okay. Steve, could you please open us up in a word of prayer? Just rowdy group? Yeah. Okay. God forgive us. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Lord, for all you do. We thank you, Lord, for watching over us. We thank you, Lord, for your protection. But most of all, we thank you, Lord, for your love. Pray that you bless this group. Help us to learn your word and help us to keep it throughout the week. Be with us always in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Dave. Appreciate it. Yes, Just have that open in case someone comes through the door. Okay. So we are on day. Oh, look, and there's Arlene. She got her camera working. Great. <laughs> so they're just passing candy around right now. That's what they're. That's what got them all excited. Just like a bunch of little kids. <laughs> all right. Okay. I know, I won't be able to talk. Okay, somehow we're going to get started here. It's going to be an interesting video for YouTube. But anyway, um, we are on Daniel chapter 4. And this particular chapter is um, very unique. It, it's unique in really just about all of scripture, let alone Daniel. It's unique in that we have several outside stories that correspond to this particular chapter. So there's this guy named Megathenus from around 300 BC is his writing, and he has a short story portraying Nebuchadnezzar in a fit of madness that lasts for years and then his being restored to power. Now in the short story he doesn't talk about anything dealing with uh, doesn't talk about anything dealing with God in it but he has this short story and it corresponds nicely here with Daniel chapter 4 and then there's this guy named Nabadinus who has this prayer. And this, this prayer is actually in some of the uh, Jewish religious uh, writings. They inserted in there, even though this guy wasn't Jew, it wasn't a Jew, he was a historian for the Babylonians and writing a history. And he even writes about um, the king's madness and this absence and then return and a conversion and his thing, a conversion to the God of heaven. So what you're catching here, hopefully, is there's all these 
secular writings that match Daniel and help to say, okay, what we have here is, is truth. Something that actually happened. I'm sorry? Chris, or who, who talked? I'm sorry, I had my mic on. Oh, 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 okay. Just hearing all your side conversations, right? <laughs> well, that's fine. Okay. And then um, there's also some differences, interestingly, in the manuscripts of Daniel, the early manuscripts. And in some of those early manuscripts, the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar is much stronger than it is that we have that got settled and put in the NIV, King James NIV, and also pretty much in any translation you have now. Um, and at the end of the sheet of that, I, I have the two examples so you can kind of compare them side by side. It doesn't change the meaning of anything. It doesn't change the meaning of anything at all. Uh, but so that's a real, you know, that's a real important thing, just so you can kind of understand. Um, and the structure is very unique in this chapter. So if you look at the previous chapters that we've done so far, one through three, and then you take a look at four, four is Nebuchadnezzar talking. It's a confessional letter. <coughs> So this is, this is the king in his voice saying, here it is. And so obviously what we have here, and this is where kind of what's the belief that Daniel is a set of stories that then were later put together. They, in, in Jewish tradition, they were put together by Ezra after the return. Because what you do have is a bunch of little stories, and this one, gee, it's not written by a Jewish author, it's written by the king himself. And then you got all these secular things that back it up. And also and it's just kind of plopped in the middle here. <laughs> so that all leads to it. Okay, now the events that we're gonna be talking about here are assumed to be years after the events that occurred in chapter 3 that we just looked at. Nebuchadnezzar's full reign is 43 years altogether, and we know the insanity that's talked about here in chapter 4 lasts for seven years, and he has, and he has a year before it actually happens, after he has the dream, so there you got eight years, and then he's totally restored. So we got a lengthy period of time in here. So we know it can't happen right at the very end of his reign. Uh, so it's estimated that it's taken place 33 to 35 years into his reign, which would place it about 570 BC. Okay? So let's kind of get into this. Um, would someone please read uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3? King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. All right. So kind of a neat beginning there for Nebuchadnezzar. First he's saying, hey, this is me. I'm doing it. I am testifying to this most high God. But notice the little bit of, of hubris thrown in there. Where he says, you know, this is proclaimed to the people of all the languages. Because I'm king of everything. I'm king of all the world. He's not really king of all the world. You know, he is, he is king 
of basically by this time he's king of what would be in our time part of Iran, uh, all of Iraq, good portion of Syria, and all of Jordan, Lebanon, and down into the Sinai, you know, what's Israel, and down now to the Sinai Peninsula, and he's conquered into Egypt. That's his basic turf right there, that he, he has conquered at that time, okay? It, so it would be like he, he, he has conquered something about the size of uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and a bit of Ohio. Yeah, the, the region over there is much smaller than we realize or think about. <laughs> yeah, you think of it being big. Yeah, it's not. If you take the U.S. map and go over to them, you all see you realize how small these places are. Not good. Yeah, Babylon wasn't that big? No, not in the, it looks big on the map because we're looking on a map like that. You know, we, we look on a map like that that's just of the region and we don't think about the scale of size to things that we know about, like the United States and everything. So currently Gaza over there with Israel and Gaza and stuff, Gaza is a total of uh, 35 kilometers in length and it's about three kilometers in width. And that's it. Just take one big bomb to it. It doesn't take much. It's no, a, yeah, yeah. Two million people packed into it too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm just saying, you know, so that's, it's a really small size. It's not that big. Um, and, and none of this region is that big in what we think. But for them, that's the main thing in the world. That's the big part. Um, and so he as a king, he's saying, hey, I'm to the people of all the languages. There's no evidence that this was ever translated into other languages. Nebuchadnezzar's confession letter is actually engraved in stone. And archaeologically, they have, they have uncovered it and the inscriptions for it. it's not the it's not completely like this word for word but it's similar to him acknowledging god most high so we know this is a historical fact and that that's kind of important now the interesting thing is we have a term in here so his use of the word most high is different than when you hear Jews use it and in other places in the Old Testament. Okay, this is, the, so this word, most high, is actually, in the manuscripts, is actually an Aramaic word, and it's sultan, where, gee golly whiz, the Muslims get the idea of sultan. You know, a sultan guy in charge, the sovereign. And so he's saying he's the sovereign above all other sovereigns. We would say Lord of Lords. And so this that's one of the unique things in Daniel that's different than other places in Scripture where you see the phrase most high. But at the same time, this idea of most high and the way it's used, it would be something that, yeah, the Jewish readers would relate to because they always say God most high. In other words, above all these other, okay, we, so the Jews always re recognized, okay, we got all these other gods and goddesses out there that people believe in, but our God's above all, most high. So he's really not, if that's the term he used, it's really, he's really not giving God all the due he's supposed to, right? He is. He's saying he is the ultimate sovereign. Well, you said it means sultan. Hmm? You said an Aramaic way. It, it, it means but it's, sultan. yeah, it becomes the word sultan. So you can have, so it'd be another thing of saying, um, like you'd say, okay, Beth is, Beth is a goddess. Be careful. Okay, but then God is, God is above all 
So that automatically puts them on a, a lower tier. It puts me down there too. Well, well, you're naive. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it puts it puts way down, and that's the point you got to understand. And, and, and it's the way the Jews even thought about it too. That okay, you got all your gods and goddesses. That's nice. You think you think Dagon, you think Moloch, you think Baal is all God and stuff like that. But our God is most high. Our God supreme. That automatically puts all everything that you're worshiping in a second, third rate tab status because ours is most high. Is God over all of those things? Well, this is what Nebuchadnezzar is saying, right? But this is what Nebuchadnezzar is saying, and the Jews, see, the Jews could relate to that because the Jews looked at it that way, too. That's one reason why the Old Testament Jews so often might start worshiping other gods and goddesses and following that thing. Because it wasn't, it wasn't always in a sense of saying, we don't believe you exist. They were saying, our God's more is better than yours. Ours is most high. It's sovereign over all of them. I know it's a hard thing for us to wrap because we say, well, we know they didn't exist. And they weren't God. And even in Paul's day, Paul says, well, we know these gods the, the Romans have, they don't exist. But for the Jews, with all the people in the area, and just being a, such a common part of the culture in the area for the Canaanites and everything, they were saying, fine, okay, but ours is the most high. Ours is the God over all your little gods and goddesses. Now, most a lot of the prophets didn't think of that way, but I'm just saying in the Jewish way of thinking of things, they were thinking that way. And they could relate to this term in saying that. That's a really important term for him to be using because Nebuchadnezzar is recognizing that that God is supreme over all the other ones. And that's a really, really, really big deal. Yeah. You know, to go from thinking you're God and to then acknowledging you ain't God and these other ones are above. Okay, so any any questions or thoughts about that? Kind of neat. Mm -hmm. Kind of neat. It is neat. To yeah. see someone like Nebuchadnezzar admitting that. Yes, it is neat for Nebuchadnezzar to admit that. And it's right there in the very first beginning of the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is kind of like an early testifying moment. When you think about it. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions? Okay. So let's uh, look at now uh, verses 4 through 14. Does someone want to read that big part? Verses 4 through 14. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. I was lying in bed. The images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded all the wise men of Babylon to be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. <coughs> Excuse me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dreams, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence and told me his, told me, and I told him the dream. He is called Belshazzar after the name of my God and the spirit of the holy gods is, is in him. I said, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here in my dream, interpret it, here's my dream, interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was invisible to the and it was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were its leaves were beautiful, its fruits abundant, and 
On, on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter and the birds lived in the branches. From it came every creature was, from it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw lying in bed, I looked and there before me was the Holy One, a messenger coming down from heaven. It, he called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip it off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Okay. So, here we got a couple things. So, Nebuchadnezzar, we get an indicator in that first sentence about what time or what period in his reign it is when he says that he's at ease at home and prospering in his palace and there's peace. And so that kind of gives us an indicator as to when this is being, this is occurring because this would have been after he had already conquered uh, Lebanon, he already conquered Egypt and that part. And that was then a period. And, and then what he does is he goes and marries um, the daughter of the king of the Medes. And that's how they have a peace treaty for the longest time. And so he is totally at peace as all his borders are secure and everything. And that, that takes place, like I said, he, he reigns for, uh, what was it, 43 years. And that takes place around his 35th year of reign. So uh, we know it's, it's somewhere in there, 33, 35, based on that. Um, he again has these, you know, he has a dream, but also then notice it says fantasies and visions. In one translation, it says fantasies and visions, in other ones, it just says uh, visions. So you may have a different whatever translation you're using, but notice, so it's a dream and then it's multiple visions that are going on. And they terrify him, kind of to his core. And remember, he's writing this before, if you look back in the previous chapter, his dream that he had, it troubled him. Being troubled is, okay, gee, I'm a little perplexed. I don't understand, concerned about it, terrified. So this is another sign of his humility. Not only does he recognize that God's way above him and everything, and he's kind of acknowledging that, it is a humility, it's a humble thing to, for a king to admit that they are terrified. And then we come into the, um, how he decides, okay, I'm gonna <coughs> call all these people together. Now in your versions, in your different translations, does anyone have exorcists in there? Well, what, what, uh, so you got magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, diviners. Mm -hmm. what the oh, yeah, I'm sorry, verse seven. Soothsayers. You got suits, some have soothsayers. Chaldeans. Some have astrologers, some call it Chaldeans. Mm -hmm. Diviners. Diviners, yep, some use the word diviners. In some translations, they use the word exorcists, but exorcists are are not exorcists as we think of, as people casting out evil spirits. It's more like diviners, people who are interpreting the spirits, these spirits. That's what diviners would do. They would divine what the spirits were saying. So that's where soothsayers come in, things like that. All those words, and, and you'll notice there, there will be difference in the translations. K 
King James Version. Does anyone have a King James Version here? Using that right now? You're using King James? Yeah, yeah and it says soothsayers? It says soothsayers, yes. The Chaldeans, uh, astrologers, magicians. Yeah. Is that a new King James? No. Okay, it's an old. old King James. I have, a, old. I have a new King James, and it says soothsayers. Soothsayers. Chaldeans, yeah. astrologers, magicians. Okay, the older, a older version of King James will say exorcist. Oh. And they were, that was the word they were using back then. And that's, I just, I just bring it up because you'll see difference. Basically, he's calling all these people that should be able to help him interpret his dream. And you notice there, in this, he is not threatening them like he did before. There's no threats going on. And notice all of these are not trying to fake them out. They're not even taking a crack at it. They're saying, got me, I have a slice idea. <laughs> and so then he calls in Daniel. Now isn't, here's things that interest people. Notice Daniel doesn't come with all of them. He has to be called separate. But he's called the chief of magicians. And a magician is not like we think of a magician. Remember what a magician was back then? Wise man. Like a wise man, yeah. <laughs> so Daniel was one of their wise men. They were considered magic because they could understand basic things like, "Ooh, here's how you boil water." <laughs> Ooh, it's magic. <laughs> I literally though, but that's why they were called, and also when someone could do what we say like a psychologist would do or a psychiatrist would do or a counselor, they would call that magic. Ooh, they're, they're seeing inside someone's soul. It's magic. And so he interprets a dream, so therefore he's under this magician thing. Um, so here he comes, the L, uh, and then he, you get these images in this vision. Now a tree, trees are used in a lot of different religions. Why do you think that is? Why do you think trees are religious and you see them? Gee, just look at purpose-driven the Purpose Driven Church, and he has a little tree picture. Right? You, know, you see that often on Christian things, little trees going on there. And they're used in Hindu, they're used in Buddhism, they're used all over in lots of different religions, trees. They're used in Judaism. Why Sign do you of think life. Hmm? Sign of life. Sign of life, yes. Of life. Gold star. Yeah. <laughs> of prosperity. I didn't even look at it that way. I was thinking, boy, well, they would have lots of burn if you cut that tree down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, the one described in here. Yeah, 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 yeah lots of firewood there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, trees are seen as, as symbols of light. They're seen as, as symbols of, of light and, and prosperity and growth. So they're they're used. They're also, you know, the life, and that's why we use them as you think of generations. You know, you see an ancestry, the little ancestry trees, and they grow and branch. Oh, that's just another sign of life that goes on for generations after generations and everything. So trees are really always a very important religious symbols that are used throughout. And they were used, there, there are archaeological findings that have images of trees being used to depict 
uh, the king's reign and presence in Babylon and used in other uh, other uh, kingdoms also in Persia later and everything. So here he has the tree and that comes in, that's important. And the, the, the big part here though is that it's the strong and enormous and it touches all the way up into heaven. It's, it's like God-like. Now the word heaven that's being used here is not heaven in the sense of a spiritual realm. Heaven in the sense of way up there where the clouds are. <laughs> and the tree is that enormous and it has these branches and notice what it's doing. Um, that it was visible all over the earth. Again, this idea that he, as a king, was most powerful and covered all the earth and it had all this nice full and had abundant, abundant fruit and produce and it could provide for everyone, the shelter and thing. So this is this image of good old Nebuchadnezzar's reign. A king known over all the earth and providing shelter and food for everyone care this giver of life in a way okay and but then we got this now in some it says a, a in the revised standard it says a holy watcher others say a holy messenger there are even some translations that say it's an angel, a holy angel. But the, the main point here is that this person, this is not someone of earth that's doing this. And they are a messenger. Someone working for someone else. <laughs> Obviously, God. Okay. Get it? You getting that so far? <laughs> the basic. Any, what? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. I'm sorry. My brain was speaking out loud. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> It's a good thing it's at least speaking. I like it. Yep. <laughs> so, okay, so then he cuts down the tree and chops off its branches and strips off its foliage and scatter the fruits and the animals flee and everything falls. So, not something of earth is cutting down this tree and getting rid of it. And all that the winter shelter scatters all over. Okay? So that that's kind of a significant portion in there. Any questions about any of that? Yeah, I actually meant to go on and read the other verses. I'm sorry. <laughs> Finish out the video on that one. My mistake. But uh you know, he says then that the uh, leave the stump and the roots in the ground, so they stay. And this idea of putting a band of iron and bronze on them so they can't be uprooted or taken out. And then let him be bathed with the dew of heaven and let his lot be with the animals of the field and the grass. And let his mind be changed from that of a human and let the mind of an animal be given to him and let seven times pass over him. And this is yet another one of this, what seven times? Now in this we see later it's seven years. But you can't always apply years to the word times. 
The word times and how it's used here is a period of time. Some designate a period of time. So this, this is just letting you know that you're going to go nuts and be out in the wilderness with the animals. For well, and Daniel interprets it yeah. and gives them this interpreter. And then the sentence is rendered by decree of the watchers. So the messengers, the ones from heaven. In other words, they're conveying this from God. It's not a decree of human hands. It's not like saying some other kingdom is going to come over here. The, king, the kingdom of Joan is going to go beat up on the kingdom of Audrey and take it down. <laughs> you know, it's nothing like that. It is something from God. God's controlling all this. And that lets you know that it's ordained by God. Okay, any questions about any of that? Okay. So, picking up then. Could someone please read on uh, Daniel chapter 4, beginning at verse 19, 19 through uh, 27. Yeah. Verses 19 through 27. Then Daniel, also called Belshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversities. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals, and having nest, nesting places in its branches for the birds. Your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion extends the distant part of the earth. To what? To 27. Okay. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it. But leave the stump, bound with iron and bronze, in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by him. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree that Most High has issued against my king, my lord, the king. You will be driven away from the people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on the earth and give them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its root remain means that the kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, please be pleased to accept my advice. Ren renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Okay. So. Uh -oh. There they are. <laughs> Lost you on the screen there. Good. Right. Didn't close it out accidentally. So now, Daniel interprets the dream. The parts are kind of what we just described in terms of the tree being uh, the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. And then about it being chopped down. But it's going to be reestablished. And that's an important part. Notice how though in this interpretation beforehand, Daniel is himself terrified by this and perplexed. 
by it all. Um, and he, it's, you know, in, in one version it says, you know, severely distressed for a while. So there's a period of time. We don't know whether it's a few hours or a few days, but he is distressed and terrified. He doesn't give an instant interpretation. Why do you think he would be terrified of something happening to this other king? He had his displays and, you know, with the people up high. Yeah. Oh, okay, that something might happen to him. Well, later we'll see, you know, when Daniel does the handwriting on the wall and he says there's this other king going to come, and gee, it happens within 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> He's not too worried about that. This particular time, Daniel is because he doesn't understand why. What? What's? Why are you bringing this about, God? And often we don't. You know, something's going to happen, and maybe we don't understand why is God bringing this kind of stuff about. Why is this occurring? Daniel knows. And he's close enough to God, knows that all these kings come from God. He understands, okay, the Israelites were singing against God. They were doing all the wrong things. God's promised that he would bring this stuff about. That's why we're exiled. Got it. Might not like it, but I understand it. Here, okay. Why is God bringing this thing about and this calamity about, which can be a calamity when you have a government, you have a person in power, but they're not really now in power. And there's going to be this seven times period where they're not going to be in power. And it, it's scary. What's going on? What's the whole purpose of this? And notice what Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar to do. Yeah, repent and what else though? Be kind to the oppressed. Be kind to the oppressed. Who's the oppressed? The Israelites. Well, it's not just the Israelites. Who? Who? Because he would have just said, "Be kind to the Israelites." <laughs> See. Yeah, this, okay, well, sometimes or often nowadays we interpret it as being poor, okay? There was, a, there was a difference between poverty then and poverty now. There's a huge difference. People in poverty now would seem rich to the people in poverty then. <laughs> you know, just from the fact of having possessions and having a roof over their head. People in poverty then had literally nothing. Were, you know, that's why the Israelites were commanded to leave the corners of the field so people could glean just from that. I mean, they're, they're literally being scavengers and just trying to glean. The oppressed, though, were not just the poor in that sense. The oppressed were people who the system of justice was not being too just to. If I had a certain position or wealth and you were below me and I, you had something I want, I could falsify something against you so that you'd go to jail and I could steal what I want. That's oppressing a person. When they are unjustly jailed, when they are unjustly treated. So it has much more to do than just being poor. It is a thing of treatment and of not being treated justly. As Christ said, the poor will be with us always. Mm -hmm. And he said, don't, don't show favoritism to the rich, but don't show favoritism to the poor. You know, when they're talking about justice and righteousness, they're talking about the relationship. And when they're talking about oppressed people, they're talking about individuals that are being mistreated 
by those who have the power or system. Yeah. I know you probably don't have an answer for this, but what's the difference between what he's doing to the his people under his reign and what David did to his officer when he had him sent to the front to be killed so he could take his place? He's doing the same thing as oppressing that guy, right? Mm -hmm. David was doing the same kind of oppression. Well, one of the things the Israelites are condemned for is oppressing. When Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 5, says, what does God want? For you to seek justice and righteousness. That's what God wants. And, and it's something we always have to keep in mind that what God truly wants, and it is a message all the way through Scripture and the New Testament, is this act of relationship. Because that's what those terms actually mean. And so what he's talking about is, you know, what Daniel is saying here is, hey, King, there, it, it, it kind of just goes with the turf. Even though you've got laws and you're doing all the good things because they do have laws and, and in comparison to other places out there, they're, they're downright civilized. <laughs> what I'm saying is that what Daniel did to his guy, was his oppression was no different than what Nebuchadnezzar as they were doing well, people, right? Dave, David, in David's reign, a lot of it, they, they didn't try to oppress, and he would try to correct any injustice that was brought on by any of his officials. But he, then he goes around and does it anyway. Occasionally, yes. And then he repents of it. Okay. But only occasionally. Okay. But no, well, but I'm just saying he repents of it. He recognized David. Yeah. That's why David's heart is after God, because he recognizes when he does wrong. When he goes and, and bumps off Uriah and steals his wife, he ends up eventually recognizing it. And we know from Psalm 51, his soul was wrecked by that. He was just, you know, it was horrible for him. Versus it becomes... When they talk about systemic injustice, mm -hmm. when it becomes a regular part of the system, okay. this goes on and on, on and on and on. Gotcha. There is no correct, and it's just accepted. And that Israel became that before the exile. And in Babylon, it probably was, oh, here's a high official, there's a, a lower nobody, and oh, gee, I like your house, or I like that or field. Or the, the vineyard where they had. Right, Ahab's vineyard is an example of it. And you just trump up charges, lie, send the person off to prison, and steal what you want. And everyone says, okay, even though they know it's all trumped up. And it's just a bunch of lies. <coughs> and, and that goes on. That's true, systemic. That still goes on in some countries. <coughs> Well, it, it does. It does. Yeah, it does. But so Daniel in this is telling Nebuchadnezzar, hey, repent of you know, personal sins, but also give relief to all these people oppressed. <coughs> and that's what he means by oppressed. Okay, that's what oppressed means. So, any questions or thoughts about any of that? Okay, so let's go ahead now. We'll go into the fulfillment of this whole thing. <laughs> Would uh, someone read verses uh, 28 through 33? All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later as the king was walking on the roof of his royal palace of Babylon. He said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what 
is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. Okay. Uh, go ahead and read 35. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Okay, thank you. Okay, so here we have the fulfillment of it. Now notice 12 months, a whole year has passed by since this was all done and interpreted. And in this, in Nebuchadnezzar's own words, we don't get any indication that he took what Daniel said to heart and repented of his sins and sought to be kind to the oppressed. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar's the one writing all this, what happened after the fact. He doesn't say, gee, Daniel told me this, and I really thought about it, and yeah, I decided, I issued a bunch of decrees, and <laughs> he doesn't do that. Who reigned while he was for those seven years? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of get to that. You'll get to that, because I don't remember reading it. Be patient, Joe. <laughs> I just don't remember reading it, that's what I heard. Of course, I don't remember a lot of it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so for for a year he's going, and notice what he's doing. He's out there on his balcony, you know, where the great hanging gardens of Babylon are. He's literally out there smelling the roses, so to speak. You know, smelling the flowers. But he has his beautiful hanging gardens. He's looking over everything. He says, aren't I a great guy? Are those gardens still there? No. 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 A bunch of just desert is there. <laughs> There's ruins, yeah, and, wow. and things like that. But, but you know, so he just, you know, is saying, "Look at this! Aren't I a great guy? She got me this. I'm wonderful." <laughs> and and then we get the phrase that, if you pay careful attention throughout the Old Testament, and, and you will see that phrase used over and over again at different times while the words are still on his lips. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> while the words are still on his lips. Boom. So the judgment is happening. Boom. Without warning. He's fat, dumb, and happy, enjoying himself, and all of a sudden, boom! <laughs> it occurs on him. Wow. Just like that. He's driven insane, driven away. It's for seven years. And then you come to the question, which is a practical question, which we're never given the answer in Scripture. Who reigned during the time? Great question. We don't know. The secular sources, like I said, talk about him being insane for a period of time and everything like that, but they never talk about it being right. So we're left with the thought since no other king ascended, his son didn't take over yet. So I guess there's nothing in the his writing son, back in the no, no. Nothing about his son taking over or anything like that. So what was it kind of like, you know, in my brain? I think of Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, after World War I, suffers a severe stroke. 
and he's he's totally incapacitated by the stroke 100 percent out like a light he's in the white house they don't tell anybody mrs wilson who's the new mrs wilson because his first wife had passed away and he remarried mrs wilson is constantly kind of like one of these things they come up and they go, well, we need the president to make a decision about something. Let me ask him. She goes in the room, waits a little bit, comes back out and says, here's what he said. <laughs> so she was the first president. Yes, well, first and, woman. well, and some historians say she was the first woman president because she was literally, and, and, and he's like that, and they never told anybody. For, for, the, for, the, for the last year of his presidency. He is totally 100% incapacitated because he's trying to sell, he's trying to sell the uh, Versailles yeah. Treaty to make the League of Nations and get everyone to join the League of Nations. And in the midst of barnstorming it and everything, he has, suffers a massive stroke. They stick him on the train, they get him back to DC, they sneak his body back in the White House, put him in the bedroom and only Mrs. Wilson and the doc knows his true state. And he's basically what they think is hospice care waiting for him to die. And they don't tell anyone because they don't want the vice president to take over. Wow. He was a, he's a, it's kind of like nobody knows that he we knows why he's here. He was a candidate he was too socialistic and too much of like a communist. Yeah, who was it? Who I forget. Was? My brain oh. is not remembering. <laughs> but anyway, so with Nebuchadnezzar, I'm thinking about the same kind of thing. They said, gee, he's nuts. But Daniel said he's going to come back. So, okay, let's keep things. There was hope for God. Thank you. You know? Yeah. That's like stuff. Somebody break out your dog food. Go feed them. Puppy child. Generation. Puppy child. Go, go, go trim those toenails that are growing too long. Put <laughs> hair over a while. You know, I, I love the thing when kids stuff. They make such neat images of them. Great for Halloween. What did Veggie Tales say <laughs> yeah. about that? Yeah. <laughs> you okay? You have a fit over there? Or what? No, it's okay. still for the pod. Oh. <laughs> and so, keep it down there. <laughs> now, here's, here's the important part, okay? So he is secluded from it, figuring probably other people are ruling. Somehow they're keeping his reign going, which co corresponds to the dream that says the the stump is still there, it's not uprooted. And then at the end of seven years, notice he, he lifts his eyes up to heaven. It's kind of an important order. He lifts his eyes up to heaven. And then all of a sudden his sanity is restored. So as quickly as it was taken away, as quickly it is restored. And he gives right away praise to the Most High God, and he honors him. And so then in this aftermath, since we're hitting seven o'clock now, in this aftermath, everything's restored to him. Almost in a Job-like thing, it says he is greater afterwards than he was before. And he becomes a believer in God. It's a big conversion for him. But it never went any further than that, that his kingdom worshipped God. His kingdom and everybody just still kept worshiping all of them. Yeah, and all, yeah. And all archaeological evidence, no, there's no evidence that he made it the state religion type of thing. But he himself was converted to it. Right. And that's, that's, that's kind of a big deal. Now, at the very end there, on the very end of your sheet, what you see is, okay, here's Daniel 4, 37, this little conversion statement, as we have it typically in, in most translations that you see. 
Now, in some of the manuscripts of the Greek Septuagint, which remember that that was the Old Testament, the Greek Old Testament, that they once they translated the Hebrew into to Greek, this is that what would be that verse. And you can see how much larger it is. And it even has a thing, you know, kind of saying, hey, these gods of other nations, they can't do these things and stuff like that. And it's the acknowledgement that God is the one that sets up kings and takes them down. Now, theologically, think what that means. Think what that means about God being the one that sets up kings and takes them down. So these clowns over in Iraq and Iran now and stuff like that, God is sovereign over them and right. he's not going to let them and, carry and, them like this. But that God set them up. Yeah, he set them up. That God set he's up. He's also going to take them down though too, right? Well, for a reason. Yeah. But I'm just saying that God and he set that up God, Biden. And he set up Biden. Yes. But then, <laughs> let's look at what America does. I'm is just he happy with this. Well, but you know, the thing is, is this idea that God is setting up kings and taking them down, that this control is all that that has a lot of implications all the way through. Mm -hmm. And please take note that at no point did Daniel ever say, even though this is an ungodly thing to an ungodly business, at no point does Daniel say, let's go organize a protest. Let, 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 me start, let me start a resistance cell to take them down. We can regain power. It, it has a lot of implication. It, it's a theology so, it has so much implications on how Christians and how godly individuals reacted to ungodly rulers and what they did. So does that mean we should just sit around and wait? Well, we have, in this country, we're blessed with, as a citizen, we have certain responsibilities we carry out. And those responsibilities are to vote and to make decisions and to let our, our thoughts, our opinions known about stuff. That's part of our responsibilities as citizens that we're supposed to put it out there. But most at the same time, we, we we have an obedience first to God and a recognition that God's above all this stuff anyway. And so therefore, we carry out God's instructions, even if it means death, as with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But as long as what the person is saying isn't con contradicting what our duty to God is and our obedience to God, then therefore we'll follow that. Question about mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar's conversion. Mm -hmm. Now, he was like a, a, a wild animal grazing in the fields. Now, is his mind actually working like he knows what he's doing and he does, or is it his heart that changes? It, it says his whole sanity is gone. I know, okay, so. He was how does he know? He, how does he know what it is? How does he know when it comes to that point? Because he's, yes, God, you are he's real. Look, he looked up to heaven and. <clears throat> And guess what it says? Notice the order. He looks up to yeah. heaven, seven years have passed, the seven times. And just as quickly as it came upon him, his sanity was restored. Looks up to heaven, boom, sanity restored. And that's what, and then he realizes and the that. sanity restored, yep. So it's, okay, it just doesn't make sense. But. Headache, you take a pill, headache, gone. No, but, I mean, you're talking about real life. <laughs> you're, he's giving God be credit that yes, you are the most high God. How does he realize this if his brain's not working? Well, he's not, or his heart's not working. But his sanity was restored, so he does realize it now. He didn't look up to give praise. Mm -hmm. He just happened to look, to look up, up and look then up. he was restored. He was hit yeah. by a bull lightning and right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any, any other questions or thoughts? How about anybody out there on uh, Zoom land? 
Oh, man. Of course. Yeah, but the screen was shut down. Oh, God. See you then. Goodbye. Thanks, Jeff. You're welcome. So what I'm saying was she, she said something about the hall was the same way. Yes, but the whole brain wasn't shut down. He was just born here. Well, even with.